Hello, I'm Mick McKenzie from Brown Dakes with Education Team. I'm a partner that specialises in governance and in particular joint working between schools and academies. This short training video is aimed at head teachers, business managers and governing bodies and provides an overview and explanation on how you can use a collaboration company to support your collaborative vision. For me, there's three main pillars of reform that are driving more formal structures amongst schools. Firstly, there's the government's reforms around teacher training, the expansion, for example, of Teach First, the talking around increasing teachers' powers to deal with behaviour. But perhaps particularly relevantly, there's the teaching school programme and the creation of formal teaching school alliances where schools are working together to raise standards and teaching practices. You then have the whole accountability agenda where we've seen new standards in the primary phase, so for example the new phonics testing, and in secondary you have the introduction of the e-bag. Ofsted have also changed their framework and they've changed the terminology so we no longer have satisfactory schools but requires improvement. All of these means that schools are under increasing strict standards that they have to perform to. The final area of reform is the whole autonomy agenda and this is really around the academy's programme in its very widest sense and the impact this is having in local areas where academies are becoming free of local authority control and schools are having to increasingly buy and locate their own areas of support where traditionally the local authority would have been the provider. So all of these reforms mean that schools are under increasing pressure where they know that actually converting to academy does not provide a safe harbour and that whether you're a maintained school or whether you're an academy, then if you fall below the centrally set targets, there is a risk that your school may have some form of intervention from either the local authority or from the Department for Education. Before looking at the model in detail, I think it's worth reminding ourselves of the various different structures that have existed for many years now. So first of all, there was the informal collaboration, or what some called a soft federation. So this is typically not a legally binding arrangement, but it's a group of schools where there's good personal relationships between the heads, and they're working together in a local area to deal with particular issues. You'd then have hard federations where you'd have one governing body that had responsibility for operating two or more schools. It was then the trust school programme and you could have a shared trust that was appointing governors to two or more schools again. In the early 2000s we saw the introduction of the academy programme under Labour and the development of academy groups where a single academy trust was responsible for operating more than one academy. Now, some of these models are actually mutually exclusive and you can't have a trust school arrangement within an academy group, for example. But you'll see that some of them can work side by side together. So the educational landscape is becoming more complicated, but you can see you can have an academy group where one of its schools is within a soft federation with a number of other schools that sit outside that academy group. Darson schools are another good example of this, where typically, because of the government requirements for Darson schools, it can be difficult for them to join formally with multi-academy trusts unless they're also a Darson multi-academy trust, but they can participate in informal collaborations. You've then seen over the years a wide variety of informal partnerships. Typically, for example, these could be heads partnerships or special schools partnerships or perhaps education improvement partnerships. A hallmark of these is that they're very informal and fairly fluid and they can be typically quite large in terms of the number of schools that they encompass. I think one of the key things that we as school leaders need to appreciate is that we need to be an intelligent browser in terms of the partnerships available to us. We can all recognise that our school can get involved in a whole multitude of partnerships, but the time's really coming now where we need to actually invest time in those two or three partnerships that are really going to deliver and meet the needs of our school's children and our learners. So since the introduction of the Academies Act in 2010, we've really seen the emergence of two new approaches to schools working more formally together. Firstly, there's the academy groups option. And there's a variety of different ways schools can work together with academy groups. And then you have collaboration companies. 
Now, school companies aren't new, but what we've really seen is that companies have been set up rather than just to share services with educational collaboration and school improvement at their heart, and that's what's new about these ways of working together. So we're really seeing the key driving forces around these formalisation of collaborations is the economic restrictions and the restrictions on funding mixed with the raising standards and accountability framework that schools are being placed under. So what does a collaboration company look like? Well, I think it's useful to understand that there's two distinct relationships that go on between a school that sets up a school company and the school company. Firstly, there's a constitutional relationship. So there's a relationship with you as the governing body of the school or the academy and the company. And then there's a contractual relationship, which would be set out in a collaboration agreement, which sets out legally binding obligations the company has to all of the schools. So why use a company? Why not just carry on with a formal partnership agreement? Well, one of the key drivers we're seeing is the changes around the introduction of academies. You may be aware that the school collaboration regulations allow you to establish a joint committee between two maintained schools or maintained schools and a further education college. But because academies are state-funded independent schools, they sit outside that regime. So it's not possible to have a joint committee that involves a maintained school and an academy trust where there's formal delegation of decision-making powers to that joint committee. Now for me, school partnerships are most effective where the larger group delegates down to a smaller group to actually deliver the agreed activities. So that's one of the key benefits of a, a company approach. In my experience, the academy programme can actually act as a break on collaborative work because schools want to sort out their approach to the academy programme before they deal with any formal partnership working. And the benefit of this sort of approach is actually you can just put the academy debate to one side and get on with putting in place an effective, robust, formal partnership. And it doesn't matter whether the schools within that partnership take a different route to the academy programme or whether they're never going to become an academy. Some other typical advantages of using a company is about ring fencing risk. And this is the whole idea of schools having concerns about being the host school for partnership activities. And with the pressures around funding going forward, we're seeing this as an increasing issue that is worrying chairs of governors and their governing bodies. Equally, you can see a lot more shared governance of joint activities. And actually, a well-constructed school company approach can give a lot more scrutiny for governing bodies as to what the schools are doing jointly and making sure that it's actually delivering for your school and for your children. And we're going to see, I think, Ofsted increasingly focus on making sure that schools can evidence and show that they're getting value out of partnership arrangements for their learners. You can also have some of the benefits of streamlined governance by adopting a company structure. So one of the obvious examples is you can have valid board decisions taken by email. And this can be really useful when you're looking at a group spreading across a rural area or perhaps where you've got a large group spread across a large area. One of the final examples of the benefits is the fact that the company can employ staff. Now, you have to be mindful there can be some complications here if you're wanting to transfer staff from the schools that actually have access to a public sector pension scheme, but there still are opportunities for employing staff. So, for example, we've seen school partnerships employ a former head teacher of one of the schools where they already have their pension arrangements addressed and they're happy to not have a public sector pension from the shared company. Key point to appreciate though is, is that the governing bodies can have strategic control over what the joint company can carry out and importantly place certain restrictions on the activities it can carry out without coming back to the schools to get their consent and I'll explain that in more detail when I run through the collaboration agreement. I think it's important to understand that a school company actually only has authority to do what you, the schools, ask it to do. It is not responsible for running the individual schools. It can't tell an individual governing body what to do. What it does is it carries out the activities that the schools ask it to carry out within the authority the schools set it. So how does it do that? Well, you'll recall I talked about the constitutional relationship and the contractual relationship. The constitutional relationship is, would be set out in what's called Articles of Association. Now, this is the company's written constitution. It would set out all the rules you'd expect about who the members are, how directors are appointed, how you call meetings, 
what quorum for a meeting is. But the key things that need to be decided by schools in the constitution is what your objects are going to be. So what are the purposes of the company? My advice would be to set up broad but education related objects so the governing bodies have protection that the company can only carry out activities that are linked to their core purpose. And in terms of the membership, that would typically be one school, one academy, one member, all with equal rights. If we look at the composition of the board, this can be more tricky and would often depend on the local circumstance of the schools. We've set these companies up for groups of schools from, say, six schools all the way up to about 40. Now, I would urge schools to consider having a small board of directors, somewhere between five and ten, to make sure that you're getting the benefits of delegating down to a smaller group of people that are going to actually manage the day-to-day -day joint activities of the collaboration company. The contractual relationship is set out in the collaboration agreement. This does two key things. Firstly, it sets out a framework for how you're going to operate. So it will set out how you're going to agree what, what activities you're going to do each year, how those are going to be funded. Now typically I'd suggest a relatively strategic approach here to having a rolling three-year delivery plan which is reviewed annually and the schools agree each year how much money they're going to put into the collaboration company. The benefit of this approach is it enables you to develop the size of the activities over a period of time. Another key area I think it's important for schools to focus on in the agreement is the aims and objectives clause. Now, by this I mean something more focused than just generic statements around benefits of learning communities for every child within the schools, but having a real agreement about what you as a group of schools are trying to achieve and what success in delivering those objectives looks like, so that you can really make sure that governors and Ofsted can see that you're getting value out of this joint arrangement. I'd also suggest that you'd consider having what I'd call a moral code, where this is in effect a code of conduct between each school and the company as to how they're going to work together and support the joint activities. As governing bodies, we all have our own codes of conduct, but typically partnerships between schools don't have some of those basic principles set out. So I think it's something well worth spending some time to agree. Finally, I talked about you being able to place restrictions on the school company via the collaboration agreement, and this would be done in two ways. Firstly, you would define what the permitted activities of the school company were. So the benefit of this approach means is you can start off very narrowly in terms of the activities it can carry out, and as you become more comfortable with the model over time, you can authorise it to carry out more activities. The second aspect of this would be having a list of material matters that are so important to the schools that it's important that you need to go back to the governing bodies of the schools to get their consent before the company can do that particular activity. So examples of this would be employing staff or say employing staff with an annual salary of over £10,000 or for example entering into a commitment to incur capital expenditure or again you could set a threshold and have entering into capital expenditure over £10,000. The good thing about this approach is you can set the level where you as schools are comfortable and you can tailor it to the activities you're asking the company to deliver for you and these can be relaxed over time as you become more familiar with the model. Two key messages I'd like to share with you. Firstly, at a recent conference I was at, there was a really good question from the floor where the panel of experts were asked what was the one key thing that the delegates should take back to their schools. Pretty much unanimously the panel all said something along the same lines and that is the importance of going back to your schools, finding out who your partners are and investing time in those relationships. I really do think as school leaders we need to look around us as to our local partnerships and invest the time to develop those two or three partnerships that will really enable us as a group of schools to meet the challenges ahead. And the final thought is around this is an evolutionary, not a revolutionary model. If I was drawing an analogy, I'd do it to Christopher Columbus. He was going out to discover the new world. He didn't know what the challenges were, but he knew he was going to face some fairly significant hurdles so he needed a secure ship to take him there. This model and approach enables you as schools to do that. You don't know what all the challenges are going to be ahead, but you do know you're going to have a common interest in addressing them as a strong and effective group of schools.